Uh, okay, so I want to be talking about something specific. Do you guys know what is going on? It is uh, coming up here October 7th through November 5th. What's going on? Brr, 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 brr. Not a holiday. Well, maybe for some of us, lucky ones go on vacation. That's, we're voting. October 7th is when the ballots start coming in. November 5th is when we have to be done or we can go into the polling places and vote. And I, in light of only being two weeks away, would like to share with you some of the most ridiculous laws ever made. Does that sound good? That's how we're starting today. Okay, this is in Paulding, Ohio. Those Ohioans. <laughs> Okay, you get to explain to me this law. Policemen are allowed to bite a dog if they think it will calm the dog down. <laughs> All right, this one's in Texas. It's illegal to sell your eyeballs. <laughs> Just makes me feel better about Texans. This one's interesting. Carrizozo, New Mexico. It's forbidden for a female to appear unshaven in public. Which makes me wonder about those New Mexico women. Like, why did they? <laughs> All right, uh, Illinois, it is illegal to have a sleeping donkey in your bathtub after 7 p.m. <laughs> Last one. This is Riverside, California. Yeah, right? Kissing on the lips is against the law unless... Both parties wipe their lips first. Now, if I was gonna go kiss my wife and she goes, hold on, I'm not gonna kiss her. Like there's all kinds of ridiculous laws. I don't even know if these have, what level of truth these have in them. I found them on Google. But the truth is, is that a lot of us, we, we look at the laws that come in from Sacramento and Washington and how many of you guys are just disappointed and exhausted from the craziness that is coming? It's, it's just too much. And, and in fact, what it does for us is it makes us feel about politics like just throw your hands up, roll your eyes and just say it's hopeless and get out of it. In fact, many people don't vote because of that same thing. They, they feel, listen, God is sovereign. He's gonna do what he wants to do without my help anyway. I'm just not gonna vote. Or they say things like, it's, it's a hopeless situation. There's no purpose in doing it at all. Or what many of us feel is it's, it's hard to see the lies. Is it hard to see through the lies? It is so difficult to see through the lies. And, and that's what happens when we come into the vote. There's just these lies that are propagated by politician and candidates and, and measures and they're written wrong and we can never know what the truth is behind them. So why vote at all? Well, that is exactly what we are gonna be talking about today. We are gonna have an election message two weeks before it's time to vote. Does that sound okay with you guys? All right. And um, in this, I'm gonna first, we have to first address something. We have to first address the idea of politics inside the church. Should politics be allowed inside the church? Does the church have any uh, territory inside of politics? And, and, and there's differing views here. So I'm, I'm just gonna say this. If you're on the fence and you don't know, if, if you're new here and, and, and you don't know how, kind of how we believe, I wanna ask you this, just for the next 35 minutes, just be open, okay? Let's be open to what the scriptures say. Let's just let the Bible unveil itself. Is that, can that be fair? Is that okay? And if you do believe that, uh, that politics should be in the church, then use this as a way to understand and gain some words and ideas so that as you're out in this world and you hear that church should not be involved in politics, you have some ammo to use, amen? Cool? Okay, so we are gonna jump in to this election message. Um, and, and I wanna address this idea that the idea that, that church should have no, no workings in politics, we hear it all the time, and we don't just hear it from the media, we hear it from churches. It's a regular thing that we know. But I'm gonna tell you that that is a relatively new idea because most of American history, the church has played a profound, found impact, impact on uh, governing issues and policies and candidates. In fact, uh, 
Gary Hamrick of Cornerstone Chapel in Virginia, he addressed this important topic and he really focused in and talked about these two significant books, volume one, volume two. The books are called Political Sermons of the American Founding Era. And these are from the dates of 1730 to 1805. This is when America was being established and it was when it was building. These two books, you cannot tell right now, are two gigantic volumes and they have 1,779 pages of small print, by the way. That is how many pages are in these two volumes. So what is this book about? It is about pastors. It is sermons from pastors during this era that took their responsibility to evaluate all of life through the lens of scripture. That is what these sermons are. They are addressing issues of their day, political issues of their day, candidates of their day, measures of their day from the pulpits. Most of American history, the pulpit has been a place that taught about how to live and how to evaluate politics. Now, some of you guys might be thinking, well, how true can that be? Because there's this famous phrase that we have that came from our founding era called separation of what? And every single one of us know that. We know how to end that. We know that phrase because it is talked about and used against the church all the time, trying to get churches and pastors to be silent. But can I tell you a little bit about the phrase separation of church and state? This is interesting. Um, this phrase does not appear in our constitution. It does not appear in our Bill of Rights. It does not appear in any founding documents for our nation at all. Do you want to know where this phrase comes from? It was originated by Thomas Jefferson in a personal letter. Say personal letter. Personal letter. Not an executive order, not a law. It was a personal letter between Thomas Jefferson, the then, pre the then he was the president back then, and the Danbury Baptist Convention, a convention that they were having, and they asked the president a, a question about the First Amendment and their religious rights. And so Thomas Jefferson, in his letter, writes to them to further explain that the part of the First Amendment, the, the right for freedom of religion, is to protect the church from the government. It separates the government from the church, not the church, from the government. He explains in it that that First Amendment limits government interference in the church, that the government has no business getting in church business, not that the church has no business getting in the government. Do you guys understand this? This phrase was actually given and meant um, and originated for the church to have religious freedom and still get very political. Yeah. However, this phrase sits with us in 2024 as a form of intimidation to pastors to not preach from their pulpits, for, for people to not engage uh, in, in the political realm or uh, understandings or agendas within the church. And can I tell you guys, it's been doing a really good job at intimidating us, intimidating pastors. But that is not the purpose. It has been misused and it has been misunderstood and it has been manipulated by the media and the government. But if that wasn't enough to scare the church, there's another thing we need to introduce. And that is something called the Johnson Amendment. Who in here has heard of the Johnson Amendment? Okay, a lot of us. Every pastor in existence today knows about the Johnson Amendment. What is the Johnson Amendment? It was introduced in 1954 by Lyndon Johnson, and its primary aim was to intimidate 501c3s, which are nonprofit organizations like our church, from, uh, where are we, from, oh, by threatening their loss of tax exempt status if they engage in the political realm. Do you guys understand that? That is what, what it is. Now, how many of you guys like that we are a tax exempt place? Meaning your tithes actually get to work for your taxes and we as a church don't have to take your tithes and give it to the government. We are tax exempt. And so this has created this 
this uh, bullying and this threatening and this fear for pastors and churches to engage inside the political aroma. But I wanna tell you this, if I, as pastor of this church, do not preach the whole word of God because I'm afraid of our tax exempt status being taken away, then I have lost my saltiness, I've hidden my light, and I am not worthy of the pulpit in which I stand, amen? It's, we have to not think about politics in the church as being directed by the government, but being directed by our Father and our God. Now, this Johnson Amendment is unconstitutional, okay? And it goes against our religious freedom, but it still stands. It's been standing for 70 years, and it has been influencing churches and pastors for not speaking out. It is still a tool and a tactic they use, but I wanna tell you something. This is, this is very shocking to hear. Over the 70 years that the Johnson Amendment has stayed intact. Do you know how many churches have been tried and found and failed the Johnson Amendment have been? Uh, could, doesn't matter. Have, have, have got the punishment of the Johnson Amendment? I'll tell you, one, one church. It still intimidates this one church, Branch Ministries. They took out full page ads inside of newspapers. Do you guys remember what newspapers were? right? People would drive by and throw them inside of newspapers in 1992, urging Christians not to vote for Bill Clinton. That is the one time that anybody has been convicted. That was the word I was looking for of the Johnson Amendment and lost their tax exemption status, but it still serves as this tactic to bully. I will tell you right now, we're, we are going to be jumping into the Bible here in a second. We cannot decide what we can preach because the government or the the leading class tells us what we can preach. We have to preach only what the Bible says. And, and those guys will try to, they'll try to, to make us afraid they'll tr because they don't want us in politics. They want us to be afraid. Can I tell you something? The honest truth is I am afraid, but I'm not afraid of the government. I'm afraid of missing what God wants for us as a people. I'm afraid of missing God's calling over us as a church, over us as America. That's what I'm afraid of you, Af afraid of you. That's what I'm afraid of. I wanna tell you something real quick about our church. If you haven't been a part of Foothills for very long, I wanna get you into some of the DNA, what's built inside of this church, what our founding pastors, Mark and my dad, Dave, my, <laughs> Dave and my dad, Mark, <laughs> built this church, okay? Let me give you a couple things. First thing is that we are a church that believes in the Bible without error. We believe in the scriptures of God that it is the first and last say on every single thing, that if it says that it is right, it is right. And if it says it is wrong, it is wrong. We stand on the power of this Bible and nothing else gets to sway our opinions, okay? We also believe, yeah, praise God. And we also believe in the fear of God. We, we fear God more than we fear men, not because he is scary, but I mean, there's aspects of him, but because we don't wanna miss what he has. So it doesn't matter what the culture says. It does not matter what the cultural winds of our day are. We stand by what God has given us because we wanna live in him. And lastly, I wanna say this. We're way more, it's, it's way more important that we are biblically correct than politically correct. You understand that? Like, I, I don't really care to be politically correct. And maybe even, and, I, and by saying that the church has a place in politics, that is, a, that is not a politi correct, politically correct statement. I'll, but I'll tell you this. If it comes to the point where we as a nation don't get to proudly and loudly and courageously talk about the things of the Bible, then I will tell you, you will find your pastors at this church in jail. And we will be counting on you to break us out, okay? <laughs> That is where we are as a church. We care about this Bible. So as we are looking through this idea of church and politics through scripture, we're starting from the point where I don't care about anybody else. I care about what the Bible says only. And I think that that's probably the same place where many of us are at when we think about this. So, so what is it that the Bible says? Well, I'm gonna first tell you this, that the church's role is to be a prophetic voice to our nation. Is that true? 
Yeah, it is, right? To help show them God's statutes and how to get his blessings. And if we are quiet, that is the exact opposite of loving people, amen? So what does the Bible actually say about politics? That was the longest introduction I've ever had. Well, it's important to understand that all of the Bible talks and deals with politics, with governments, and with nations. When you look in the Bible, what you see is God dealing with kings or presidents or prime ministers or whatever you want to call them, kings. He's dealing with governors. He's dealing with pharaohs. He's dealing with nations and their people. That sounds governmental, doesn't it? Proverbs 21.1 says this, the king's heart, the leader of the country, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the who? In the hand of the Lord. And he turns it wherever he wishes. And that is what God has been doing for all of history. He has constantly put people in areas of government and leadership over nations. It, it happens regularly. Joseph, right? Joseph became second in command to Pharaoh in Egypt because God put him there. We're going to get to Joseph again in a little bit. But Daniel, remember Daniel? Daniel got put up as a governor inside of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar and four other kings. He reigned as a political leader inside of Babylon all the way to the point, you remember uh, Daniel and the lion's den, all the way to the point where he was with King Darius. And because of that situation, because God used his position, King Darius decreed that God in Babylon, that God was the one true God because God uses his people in politics. Samuel, what about Samuel and Saul? Saul was the first king of Israel. God, working through Samuel and Saul, created the government of Israel. You guys realize that? That was when it was created, the first kings. They created all of it. But he doesn't stop with just creating governments and putting people in governments. You guys know that God is involved in economics isn't he? Think about, uh, let's go back to Joseph real quick. The story of Joseph and God's moving in economics. God raises up this man, Joseph. He anoints him, calls him, and through a dream that God gave Joseph and to the point, second only to Pharaoh, that God put Joseph in, Joseph created an incredible economic thriving system for Egypt during times of famine. He created a welfare system inside of Egypt because God cares about politics. He gets involved in government. What about, uh, oh wait, I wanna say one other one. I forgot. It wasn't just Daniel and Babylon. No, let's finish, let's finish economics. Solomon, Solomon, did God use Solomon to change the economic situation of a nation? Yes, say yes, he did, okay? Yes, he did, big time. I wanna read you just one sentence in the Bible or one verse in the Bible that talks about God's dealing with a nation who follows him and what he can do to the economic situation. First Kings 10, 21, it says this, all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, which is so ironic because all of mine are of gold too. And all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None was of silver. It was not considered valuable in the days of Solomon because God cares about moving in our economics. Now I want to go back real quick to another person. Esther in Persia. God raised up a woman named Esther to be a liaison to the king for an entire ethnicity of people. Listen, all throughout the Bible, it talks about God's dealing with government. How about, let's talk about judicial system. Does God care about the judicial system? Well, I'll tell you what, if you read about Moses and his father Jethro, father-in-law Jethro, you will find out that God created a judicial system for Israel. He created it. It became, it, it worked. What about immigration? Okay, no one knows immigration more than God. His people were sojourners for most of their life. They were living on other people's land. Have you read Exodus? That is a great immigration story to their land. 
Okay, what about border walls? I'm going to tell you right now, God cares more about border walls than even Donald Trump does. You know that? Read Nehemiah. He builds them, read the battle of Jericho, and he can tear them down. God is very involved in politics. And the only way that you could stand there and you could say that God doesn't want his people to be involved in politics or his church to be involved in politics is if you haven't read the Bible wholly. You haven't read the Bible clearly. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I want you to listen. There is nothing at all that our God is not sovereign over. Amen? There is nothing, not one thing that our God is not sovereign over. And if you believe that, then you have to put politics in the same category. I want to read you what Colossians says about the sovereignty of God. Colossians 1, 16 through 17, which interestingly enough is actually on both of these uh, uh, poster boards right here on both sides of our wall. Colossians 1, 16 through 17 says this, for by him all things were created. Say all things. things. Both in heaven, in the heavens and on earth. So again, all things, right? Both visible and invisible. So again, all things, whether, oh, here he comes, getting political again, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is in charge of all things. To say that the church is not allowed to be in politics is to say that God is not sovereign, that his Bible is not true, and that he is a liar. And I'm gonna tell you right now, God is not a liar. I'll tell you that if I was the devil, I would try to get the church out of politics as well. That's what I would do. It's not... It's not God who wants us out, the church out. It's the devil. He does not want you to vote in this November election. You need to understand that. He does not, and he will influence you in any way to get you to not vote. He does not like that I am standing on this pulpit and I am saying these very things that I'm saying. He wants to silence the church. Why? because he's afraid of what will happen when we engage. Do you hear that? He wants to silence us because he's afraid of what will happen when we engage in the political realm. We are God's sleeping, we need to not be, but we are God's sleeping army that needs to awake, brush off the cobwebs of our slumber, start voting and take back our nation for God. And we get a chance to do that in this upcoming election and every single election that comes our way. Now, I wanna, I wanna go in, change. I wanna talk about three areas, of God, three things that God knows about government, three things that happen. The first thing I want us to know is this, is that I, it, this is vital. God never intended to rule the world directly. God never intended to rule the world directly. He intended to rule it through human agency. Do you guys understand that? Through us. I want to read you a scripture. Psalms 115 verse 16 says this. The heavens are the heavens of the Lord. We don't get to do anything about heaven. They are not ours. They are the heavens of the Lord. But the earth he has given. Say he has given. The earth he has given to the sons of men. That is us. He has put us in charge of the earth and the governments of the earth to rule in his stead as his ambassadors. That is our God-given mandate. Do you understand? I do not believe that it is our right to vote. I believe it is our God-given mandate to vote. Do you hear that? I don't believe it is a blessing that we have and we should take it. I believe it is from God and it is our mandate to engage in this arena. America has always been great because for its history, the the American Christians have decided that they would engage, that they would take their God-given authority and mandate and they would engage in politics. 
And that is what has kept us a great nation. I'm going to back this up. In the Garden of Eden, God irrevocably transferred his authority over the earth to us. I want to read it. It's Genesis 1, 26 through 28 says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule. Say rule. rule. What are we supposed to rule over? Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his image, and in the image of God, he created him, male and female, two only. That was a political statement right there, by the way. Now, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Say subdue. Amen. Subdue means to overcome or bring into, under control. And rule, again, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living, living thing that moves on this earth. God has delegated the governing authority to us. Do you understand that? And it's no longer just our right. It is our responsibility and our mandate to preserve a godly government. Psalms 8, 6 says, you made man ruler over the works of your hand. You put everything under his feet. Now, I want to say this. We live in a day and age where people who hate God and defame him are taking power around us. People that do not want righteousness in our country, but instead want evil. And voting is our calling to promote, protect, and preserve our godly government. Passing this up, it is giving up on our our mandate. It is allowing people that do not fear God, that do not love God and want him out of the public square to start shaping our land and eventually our families. The people that we vote into government, the policies we vote into government, or the people and policies that we do nothing about will shape the land that we grow up and our kids will grow up, they will either bring us to more righteous America or more evil America. They will either protect our religious freedom or they will try to relinquish it. And what we have is powerful. We have the God-given mandate and responsibility to vote those people out and good people in. As Christians, we have, yeah. As Christians, we must vote to promote righteousness, to protect our kids and our nation. Anything else is missing the mark. And I'm gonna say it, anything else I believe is a sin. I wanna go to the next part of this. The next thing, that was uh, God wants to rule through us. The next part is this, is that the withdrawal, and you need to hear this, the withdrawal of Christian influence has created an America we don't recognize. How many of you guys do not recognize the America that we live in today? You're looking around and you're thinking, How? Christian influence withdrawn. That's what happened. It is not the rise of evil that has given us the America that we have today. Evil has always been evil. It is always focused on evil. It has always done a good job trying to grasp power. The problem that we're in is the withdrawal of Christian influence. America is not its, uh, the way that it is on accident. We deserve the government we have. Why? Because we built it. Do you understand, right? Because we built it. Either by voting the wrong people in or neglecting and abstaining to vote. I like what Jim Dealing said. He says this. He says, we will be ruled by a system that is conceived in the mind of fallen power-hungry men and reflects the brokenness of its ruling class. Or... We will be ruled by a government system that reflects the laws of God conceived in the mind of a benevolent, benevolent creator designed specifically to produce maximum blessing and peace between the people. Which one do you want to sit under? I want the latter. And that means that we've got a job to do. But enough about what Jim Dealing says. Let's look at what God says. <laughs> Proverbs 29.2 says this. It says, when the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. Is that true? We see that. That's clear. And when the wicked rule, the people groan. And that is so clear too. 
You know, you look all, all over this world and you look at all the other nations and all the other people groups and you see so many Christians that are oppressed and they are persecuted. They have no right inside of their government. They cannot say anything. They cannot stand up. They have no power to change. In fact, even in many of these countries, as they proclaim the gospel, they do it in risk of going to jail or worse. But in America, we're different. We have a blessing. And that is that us Christians have a voice. We have the ability to stand up, the mandate to stand up and to drive righteous things, propositions, measures, and people in our government. But can I tell you something that is so sad? In the last recent, in the, in the last two elections, we have had only about 50% of evangelical Christians that voted. 50% of evangelical Christians decided that they weren't even gonna join the process. 2016, I'm just gonna do both of our presidential elections. 2016, evangelicals showed up at 56%, that's it. 44% just stayed home. They let, they let America just be what America deserves. They just, they walked away. The last one, 2021, it dropped quite significantly. 41% of evangelicals came out. Of the 62 million evangelicals in America, only 26 million showed up. We have the America we have because Christian influence has stopped. Now let's just compare that to the homosexual community. Back in 2016, when evangelicals showed up at 56, homosexuals showed up at 78% because they understand their assignment. They understand the power because they understand the, the, what's in front of them. Go back to 2020 when evangelicals were at 41, homosexuals were at 81. They understand their assignment. When are we evangelicals across America gonna understand God's given authority and assignment to us? It needs to be this year. The big problem is we've stopped voting and we've taken politics out of the church. The last thing that I wanna go over, the last part is this, is that evil men rise when good people remain silent. That's how it works. Evil men rise when good people remain silent. When godly citizens neglect or ignore politics, the government devolves into the hands of men who do not fear God. It's how it works. And then those wicked leaders draw God's judgment over a nation. All throughout the Bible, that is exactly what we see, that these evil leaders draw God's judgment. Let's look at Jeremiah 6, 19. Hear, O earth. I just want to say, it's not hear, O, just this place. Hear all of earth, all of earth. Listen to what, what is happening. Behold, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruits of their plans, because they have not listened to my words. And as for my laws, they have rejected it also. When we allow our seats in our country to be filled with, with people who do not fear God and do not care about him. Judgment comes upon our nation. Edmund Burke says this, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that the church starts or continues to be silent. I'm gonna tell you, we're, we've got a lot of things at our church that will make it easy for you to get out there and vote. You might say, look, I would love to vote, but I don't know what to vote. I am, I don't, I'm not informed. We're gonna give you a bunch of ways to be informed. Right now, 20% of evangelical Christians that, that are of age are not even registered to vote. 20% of us, that's a lot of us in here. We have something right now. It will never be easier than this. Outside those double doors, in the lobby, you'll see a table. You want to get registered to vote. It's going to take you like 100 seconds. That's it. A hunt, at that table, they will walk you through the process of how you can get registered 
to vote. If you are not registered in here, there's no easier way than that table and you could stop being part of that 20%. Amen. Also, Wednesday, this Wednesday, we are having a candidate town hall right here at Foothills in the youth auditorium. We have a ton of people that are coming from the civic area around us. The, there's a, a bunch of them. You can read it right here. And they're going to be talking about stuff. And there is going to be an entire time for questions and answers. You want to be informed? Go ask them the questions that matter to you. It's right there on Wednesday on the back of your, whatever this thing is that we give you, at 6.30 this Wednesday. But we're not stopping there either. This red part, this is our ballot breakdown. On October 11th, 6.30 in this room, we are going to have some people just going through the ballot. They are gonna go through and explain to us the measures, what they mean. They're gonna explain to us all these things so that we are not uninformed. They're not gonna tell you who to vote for. They're just gonna explain to you what the measures and what the people are on the ballot. Does that help? Yeah. We're gonna do other things. October 13th, we're gonna introduce you to a bunch of civic leaders that are running for office on this stage, just to introduce you, and we are gonna pray over them. And like always, every single time, I, Neil Hoffman, not Pastor Neil Hoffman and not Foothills, I, Neil, the, the dude, Neil Hoffman, I'm just gonna put up my ballot on my Facebook and my Instagram. It's just gonna go up there and you are more than welcome to see, see those things if you want. They're not the stance of the church, they're the stance of me. Let's, listen, this is as clear as I know how to put it. We're gonna, and let's have the band come out right now. This is as clear as I know how to put it. This October 7th through November 5th, all of us, have three spiritual choices. We are gonna make a spiritual choice. Either we are going to vote for righteousness, we're gonna vote for sin, or we're gonna sin and not vote. And, and that's the way I see it when I read the Bible. You know, the government is not the answer for America, is it? Jesus is. And we await him and pray that he will bring revival to America. But until he does, we need to be salt. We need to be light. We need to get out there and vote. We need to inject the Holy Spirit into our government so that God would come and save our land. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand up.